Here is our host, Tian Wei. Hello and welcome to World Inside. I'm Tian Wei. From species extinction to extreme weather, the planet is in crisis. Hosted by the United Nations Environment Program, or UNEP, the fifth session of the United Nations Environment Assembly meets this week. World leaders, scientists, businesses, and civil society convene to address some of the most pressing environmental issues facing our planet, such as the role the nature plays in sustainable development and how strategic green COVID-19 recovery plans can accelerate the transition to an inclusive, prosperous, low carbon and healthier nature. To explore many of these very sophisticated issues, let's loop in our panelists to hear their analysis. For more on the United Nations Environment Assembly in Boston, we are joined by Maria Ivanova, Associate Professor of Global Governance and Graduate Program Director from the University of Massachusetts in Boston. And in New York, we are joined by Pradeep Kuru Kulasuria. I hope I pronounced your name right, sir. Executive Coordinator and Director at the Global Environmental Finance from the United Nations Development Program, also known as UNDP. In Beijing, last but not least, Ma Jun, Director of the Institute of Public and Environmental Affairs and founder of the Blue Map app. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the program. Well, long expected, this uh, Environment Assembly this year is likely to focus on the relationship between nature and also human being. Uh, Pradeep, tell me more from the UN perspective, what can be achieved? Now, this is an, it's an important question. Uh, the 30th anniversary of the Human Development Report was actually titled The Next Frontier, Human Development and the Anthropocene. And the research uh, that was conducted uh, indicated that human development levels have actually projected to fall. And why is this important? This is important for the entire UN system because it's going to require governments and partners in every country communities faced with these urgent needs to halt the spread of the virus while responding to the unprecedented socioeconomic crisis that it has generated. Mm. And UNEA is an important platform for the entire UN system to actually galvanize around the topics that really have to be tackled, which are interconnectedness between nature, economic growth, and also addressing uh, the right. issues of the pandemic. Professor Ivanova, it sounds abstract though. Uh, and therefore very hard to overcome and folks to understand exactly what this meeting can achieve. Will it become one of those meetings of empty talks? Without these meetings, without talks, we cannot get to any collective decision. So what can and be so, talked at this time? Eventually, what will be the outcome do you think people are expecting? So, by the way, this, this meeting of UNEA is UNEA 5.1, yeah. only two and a half days of virtual meetings. Mm. So what can we achieve virtually with all 193 governments in the same virtual Zoom room? Um, we could achieve a common collective narrative, mm. perhaps. But what we could also achieve is to launch the 50th anniversary of UNEP. Can I follow up on the common collective narrative? What is the lowest barometer and the highest barometer for folks like you who are in the field for years uh, looking at what would be claimed as a success if this uh, narrative uh, can be formed? What exact should be, what should be included in that narrative, Maria? Two things, individual responsibility and collective responsibility. Mm, explain. Individually, we have to decide what are we responsible for, for our consumption. The collective responsibility is the one by governments, by states, whether as one government or collectively. And that is exactly what they're doing at UNEA of what are the regulations, the laws, the, the consumption patterns and production patterns that yeah. governments can decide on together. Mm. It has been long expected that meetings like this should be held and a common narrative as the other two uh, scholars have uh, uh, illustrated should be formed and yet we've been having some uh, hiccups to say the least over the past few years about the international governance including about environmental issues biodiversity and climate change now it seems that the environment has been changed somewhat how optimistic are you uh, Jun tell me more about that 
that this common narrative can be formed, that will it be sustainable or only comes with political cycles in different countries? Yeah, I think that now, you know, we have been uh, wasting four years of time, you know, with, uh, during this process, uh, during this period of time, we only see the, uh, you know, uh, climate change uh, uh, risks getting higher and also the the impact on the biodiversity mm -hmm. is, uh, has not been mitigated uh, because of that. So now, you know, finally, I think during the past four years, we have, you know, meetings after meetings uh, of international uh, negotiation and discussion. We have seen that uh, any anything related to grain and to climate almost like have been almost like cannot be very much discussed uh, uh, intergovernmentally mm -hmm. because of the uh, Trump administration's opposition, uh, but now you know. Finally, I think we uh, we have seen the global climate governance uh, uh, moving back to its uh, normalcy. Uh, yeah. We hope that uh, uh, the the COP meeting uh, held in, uh, that is supposed uh, uh, projected to be held in, in Kunming will also bring the biodiversity mm -hmm. agenda uh, back to normal. It is not a just a political issue. It is really an issue of reality. Uh, that developed economies have been taking advantage of uh, pollution, but developing countries are at a different development stage, particularly now with the pandemic threat. Uh, many of their economies are very much challenged. Uh, the debts being built up and many other things related. So Pradeep, just frankly speaking, uh, are there help provided to the global south in this regard, in terms of, you know, uh, climate change issues of biodiversity protection. No, it, it is incredibly important because if you think about it, um, by 2020, 2030, um, we're expecting a billion people um, who could be living in extreme poverty, a quarter of them as a result of the pandemic, yeah. unless we act now. Half of the world is struggling to make, make ends meet right now without social protection, like unemployment benefits, health care. Um, we do need to change the paradigm under which we work. And, and that means both you know, ensuring that finance flows to countries that most need it, but also leveraging the huge amount of domestic and private sector finance that is already there, but needs to be directed towards the kinds of investments that we need uh, for the future. This requires essentially focusing on those elements that preventing this capital to go where it needs to go, de-risking, reducing the risks associated mm -hmm. with capital flows. I mean, this is incredibly important um, today and, and a lot more needs to be done um, on that uh, front. Uh, the, the power outage uh, in uh, Texas has been uh, the headline story for the world. And now people are looking at, you know, how is this interest being, uh, you know, articulated by all uh, stakeholders and whether, you know, this will be uh, the beginning of uh, solving a problem in the U.S. about uh, what to do uh, for the energy sector and many other issues involved. Maria, tell me more about what's the latest uh, analysis you have about incidents like this and what does it have to do with our overall blueprint that we are talking about today? I'm, I'm in Boston, yes. but I'm originally from Bulgaria. I'm from a small state. Mm. Uh, and I think in your bigger analysis here, small state diplomacy is absolutely critical and understanding the the issues the interests of smaller states and now when we look at the the concerns in the united states and the states here right like texas yeah. or california or florida are getting a very different sense of what it is to be living in climate in climate change reality mm -hmm. and so i see that there is a need to reconsider what is happening in the world, both from the state perspective in, in the United States context, but also from that state perspective in the international context of small states versus large states. You mentioned just a few minutes ago, how can we play if the big players are not in the game? We can't. However, the small players have to continue and they will continue. And you see small state diplomacy and small state championship absolutely critical. We would not have had the Paris Climate Agreement had it not been for the Marshall Islands, yeah. as well as the United States and China. 
And so I think that now, and to come back to UNEA, this, the, where we started the conversation, yeah. this is the arena where small and big states come together and where we could articulate that collective narrative of mutual responsibility and accountability that we so need right now. You're watching World Inside with me, Tian Wei. Back in 2019, I had a chance to speak to Executive Director of the United Nations Environment Program, Inger Anderson. She told me how UNEP have done in tackling the lack of global governance. Let's listen in to what she had to say then. UNEP's role, Ms. Anderson, has been warning the world about the house on fire. But even after repeated warning, you do not see governments coordinate in the best way. Well, we've been warning about the house being on fire because it is. In a sense, we've been taking nature for granted. We've assumed that we can put things into the atmosphere, consume and discard um, our wastes, our carbon, into the atmosphere in such a way that and that nature would continue to absorb it, that the atmosphere would continue to absorb it, which it will not. Um, we have at the same time in, those, in all countries massive commitments at the country level, at the city level, at the state level, at the industry level, at the science level. So it's a complex world we live in. And I think if we assume that the world is on a linear path, we have been mistaken. This is, this is hard. It's actually not even an assumption, it's a fact. This is hard. And it being hard, therefore, there will be interest. But here's the thing. It's a complex situation, but we must understand. And that's why Paris highlights, leave no one behind. Mm -hmm. And in some countries, we did leave some people behind. We did not take into account the fact that we needed to make sure that we need to lift people out of poverty, we needed to create jobs for everybody, and the transition is complex. I know you're an optimist because you have to be, and you really need to be in your mission. But at the same time, may I, Ms. Anderson, remind you of the reality that we are struggling with the priorities in the world. Geopolitics, for example, lack of future plan of global governance have made all of us this dizzy in a way. So whether environmental protection, climate change will remain on top of the list as the priority as they were five years ago, for example, it's a big question mark. Unfortunately, I would say it is not a question mark because if we don't prioritize it, climate will come knocking on everybody's door. But we always only want to be firefighters. We never want to think ahead. That's the human nature too. But you see, the point here is now we are already firefighting. As I said, the house is on fire. And uh, when you are in the fire with these increasingly hard hits by nature, um, then we will stay uh, committed. You're also dealing with the house when the institutions are being questioned and being tumbled. It's not just the no, the institutions are not being questioned or tumbled. It's normal that people leave, they get other opportunities, they may get sick. It's, it's a normal situation. The good thing is we are 7 billion plus on this good planet. There are plenty of good people. If I leave my job, there are plenty of good people who can come in in my place. Because the UN is strong. We are turning 75 next year. We have been around for a long time. And so we are not going anywhere because member states are committed. So personalities might change, but our mission our, and our mandate, which is given to us by member states, is given. And it's difficult, it's complicated. There are different views, geopolitics, but there's only one way we can deal with it. And that is a multilateral platform. That is the United Nations, and that's what I work for. Jun, there were a lot of skepticism in the air earlier when China was talking about carbon neutral and carbon zero. Now, there are specific blueprints being drawn out at this moment when we speak. Now, how optimistic are you given the latest incidents, both of the pandemic and the lack of a recovery steam of the global economy for a country like China? Yeah, I can understand the uh, skepticism because, uh, you know, it was uh, uh, pretty uh, uh, 
gloomy, you know, and upset uh, prior to the to the pledge made by President Xi uh, last September on carbon neutrality in uh, in China. You know, when it comes to climate issues, uh, because of all the headwinds that we are facing, economic, social, economically. Um, having said that, you know, this is so. This is unexpected, and um, the. Um, uh, some of the pathways toward uh, zero carbon is not actually that clear, especially when it comes to uh, very high, highly energy intensive industries like uh, uh, iron steel, like uh, cement, you know, it was not that clear. But China still made this, uh, this bold uh, uh, commitment uh, and people, uh, first, uh, you know, people are happy, but then, uh, you know, they, there are also questions raised. So at this moment, it's a uh, very, um, encouraging to see that uh, uh, not just uh, internationally you know uh, other countries started uh, uh, following uh, you know when when big players uh, like China joined the game mm -hmm. uh, but also within China mo most important within China uh, you know there's a kind of a new dynamic uh, developed uh, uh, there was a kind of almost like an emergency um, uh, uh, the emergency adjustment made uh, to the 14th five-year plan yeah. to integrate so many factors uh, in terms of low low carbon and um, at this moment the most important for us is to break this 40-year uh, commitment into phases into yeah. milestones that we can achieve and also also distribute that the target to different regions and to different industries and emitters very interesting to me how the air in Beijing for example in Shanghai, for example, in Canton, for example, got much better if you travel to China these days. You know, the blue sky will count for the majority rather than the minority, unlike a few years ago. So, Jun, what exactly happened? Can China still keep that record and make it even better? I think, you know, that is the, uh, uh, not just uh, a achievement uh, that we should celebrate for the, imp uh, for, for the protection of, uh, of the health of the Chinese people. Uh, you know, when the uh, PM 2.5, the fine particles uh, concentration level in Beijing dropped from nearly 90 micrograms uh, uh, annual average to just 38 last year. Um, and um, uh, in just, uh, you know, from 2013 to last year. Uh, but also this is uh, by itself a huge contribution to the global fighting against climate change because prior to uh, 2013 our co-consumption had been tripled in just uh, uh, 11 12 years of time but ever since then it has uh, got stagnated basically n n still not you know uh, surpassed the peak in 2013 so i think this is uh, uh, by itself a huge contribution. Uh, but having said that, we're still burning half of the world's coal and um, China's uh, carbon emission is well be beyond uh, 10 billion tons. That's why it's so important uh, for us to uh, recognize uh, this uh, reality and uh, um, started taking, um, taking vast uh, massive action to try to uh, transform uh, you know, our energy mix yeah. and of course to transform our industrial structure. Mm. Pradeep, how do you see that? Is that an interesting example? Are there other interesting examples in the world that could be of inspirations? Let's just say, in order to create that common narrative all of you touched on. Yeah, I mean, I think we can uh, think a little bit about IEA's recent uh, sustainable development scenario, which, which offered a pathway uh, for the global energy system to reach, uh, uh, reach where it needs to go. And that involves a three-step strategic goal. One is to make sure the Paris Agreement uh, goals are met. Mm -hmm. Another is to ensure universal access uh, to energy. And then thirdly, substantially reducing air pollution. We have to remember that we need to cut um, you know, emissions by a very high and steep rate uh, uh, by 2030 if we are gonna make uh, these uh, targets uh, come alive. And, and that's, a, that's a difficult task, but it can be done. And one of the things I think we have to do is, is to essentially transition away from fossil fuel subsidies, mm -hmm. which is incredibly critical to achieve the Paris targets. And right now we're not getting there. We see significant amount of fossil fuel subsidies still being applied 
uh, when in fact we will be we should be already transitioning away from that mm. and a critical element in that is to reprice energy to tr truly reflect its its true cost and that requires essentially one removing or at least reducing these subsidies um, and secondly to introduce a carbon price that is sufficiently high to change the investment trajectory we've seen a generation a new generation very concerned about climate change issues very much for biodiversity, very much looking at the nature, its relationship with human being. But we also see this is the generation that's going to be impacted tremendously by pandemic, by the lack of esteem for economic recovery post the pandemic. Uh, by the way, we don't even know when that's going to happen post pandemic at this moment. So how, how are we going to see, you know, the priorities struggling of topics and attentions and uh, financial support in the world uh, in terms of policy making and also in terms of public consensus. Maria. I see on the one hand this new generation emerging with the aspirations and with commitments to make change and at the same time I feel how absolutely dramatically impacted our students are. Yeah. And so issues of equity are absolutely critical. So we, we have committed to equity and, and wellness at the same time. And honestly, we, we cannot say, we cannot have the same narrative as in the 1970s of the doom and gloom, and we have to resolve this, this problem because the end will come. Yeah. I see how young people of today are inspired by what they can do, of what their responsibility is, but also how they can trigger the collective responsibility of their government, of I their see. city, and indeed of the world. Jun, you want to take that too? Yes, for sure. Uh, I think uh, survey after survey have shown that uh, uh, the young people in China have uh, uh, one of the highest, uh, if not the highest, uh, uh, rate of, uh, uh, of awareness on the environment and even on cl climate change issues. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, but um, in the meantime, we have also seen that uh, uh, the younger generation uh, have yet to translate uh, all this uh, um, awareness into real uh, solid action. So it's very, very important for the government to create policies and uh, mechanism to help mm -hmm. them making those uh, uh, greener choices on, you know, green transportation, green consumption, and also for big business, you know, to go green, all these big brands you know, they can green their supply chain in an unprecedented way because of the uh, uh, vast, uh, you know, improvement in environmental transparency and IT new digital solutions. Okay. Pradeep? Yeah, I think two things. One is, um, if we look at the private sector, I think we are seeing a huge shift taking place um, based on um, the, the data that is coming out of the IMF, where the number of environment, social, and governance-related issues um, that are being raised among the asset management com community is actually rising. Mm -hmm. um, more, and more and more investors are looking to increase their investments in, in ESG investments um, from 2021 onwards. So this is an incredibly important issue because it's a reflection of the millennials as opposed to the baby boomers who are going to be dominating the world in the next 10 years. The other thing is really a popular choice. We just conducted one of the largest uh, popular uh, surveys in the world, 1.2 million respondents, yeah. um, on, on checking on what the, the pulse was. And more than 64% understand that we are in the middle of a climate emergency. They recognize the need to invest in forest and land, yeah. to invest in solar, wind, and renewable energy, to invest in climate-friendly farming green jobs and businesses. So the demand is out there. We just now need to ensure that is met. Connect the dots, as they say. Thank you so much for the three of you. Pradeep, Thank Maria you. and Jun, really appreciate it. Hope the conference will be a great success. Thank you.